You've probably noticed flags are up across Alabama in preparation for Veterans Day. This week, ABC 3340 is honoring all veterans as they share their voices of war. Recently, I had a wonderful opportunity to sit down with a 99-year-old Marine who lives by the Marine's motto, Semper Fi, Latin for always faithful. I want you to meet Colonel Carl Cooper of Vestavia Hills. Everybody was either going to face the draft or the enlist, so I enlisted. Carl Cooper was in his first year of college on a football scholarship when duty called. He enlisted in the Marines. It was 1942. After attending officer candidate school, the young second lieutenant found himself in the Pacific Theater, part of some of the most intense fighting of the war at Guadalcanal and Okinawa. We had more casualties in the Battle of Okinawa than any other operation. We'd take a load of stuff up, bring a load of people back. Some of them were still living, but most of them had expired. The colonel says his faith carried him through those days. Without him, we could be nothing and be nowhere. He made it home, married his sweetheart, and finished his degree at Howard College, now Samford University. The Coopers moved to Marion, where he taught biology and coached football. He valued education, eventually earning his master's and a doctorate. An old country boy, that's pretty high cotton. But the Marines weren't finished with him. He answered the call to the Korean conflict, where he served in artillery and infantry. We got the greatest country on the earth, and whatever I can do to help keep it that way, that's what I want to do. Cooper came home again, and this time answered a different calling. In 1959, he became the first principal hired from Mountain Brook Junior High School. His students came to know him as a fair disciplinarian. If you're going to succeed in that, you've got to have discipline, regardless of what kind of work you're doing. Cooper would have stayed on with his students. However, once more, he received a call to duty for his country. During the Vietnam War, he trained and recruited Marines in Washington, D.C. and in California. After Colonel Cooper retired in 1980, he went on to work with FEMA in Natural Disaster Response Services. One of his proudest moments came in 2017, when the Alabama legislature honored him with a resolution for his military service and FEMA assistance. Colonel Cooper doesn't talk politics. He does talk love of country and he is concerned. We got to install into all of our young people of today the love of our country. We need to do a better job in our schools. We need to start back and it's teaching more patriotism, patriotic, let them know about, about our history and how it has survived. The Colonel decided to wear his Marine dress blue uniform for our interview. He thought it appropriate. He doesn't need to wear the uniform, however, to convey what anyone who meets him understands in minutes. I just love my country. I love what I can do. And I'll, if they call today and says, we need you, I say, when? The Colonel turns 100 next March. At the house that he shared with his wife in Vestavia Hills, you'll see a flagpole. It stands in the front yard, and each and every day, the Colonel flies the Stars and Stripes and the Marine Corps flag. Simplify, Colonel Cooper, thank you for your service. A Korean War veteran from Birmingham knows what it means to serve. Foster Woodrick was drafted into the Army during a time when the United States was in a race war. White supremacy in his life proved much harder to defeat. And ABC 3340's Wendell Edwards tells us Foster Woodrick's story, the man who served his country, his community, and isn't finished serving yet. Every Sunday, without fail, you will find Foster Woodrick here at Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Pratt City. I'm still serving as best I can. And the light shineth in darkness. He used to serve as superintendent of Sunday school, but the truth is, at age 88, he's been serving most of his life. It was in me. 
instilled in me by both, both my mother and father. He was born in Walker County, grew up in Pratt City. He married his wife in 1947. And then a mere five years later, he got the call to serve his country. I remember that I was notified by mail to report and uh, that I did. I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for training, for basic training. He was drafted at a time that saw blacks in a whole different war, fighting racism and discrimination. Woodrick still wanted to serve America. How did you feel representing a country that back home made you less than a man? Proud. Still? Proud. Why? Because I was doing my duty. He quickly rose in the ranks, promoted from private first class to corporal, from corporal to sergeant, and finally to sergeant first class, leading his platoon. There was a demilitarized zone there at the 38th parallel. We put combat patrols and reconnaissance patrols during that time. I was scared, yes, but I was also resolute in that I was doing my duty. He served on the front lines and he saw it all. He saw death and injury. Even now, decades later, he still remembers. Most of these patrols were at night and from time to time there were skirmishes with the enemy. North Korean. His tour of duty lasted 16 months, and then he came home back to Birmingham, a city at the center of the civil rights movement. He had led a platoon against the Korean enemy, but at home, he couldn't drink from a white water fountain or sit at the front of a city bus. You were called racial slurs. I, I recall, I do. How did you respond to that? Uh, a smart remark. A stinging rejoinder at times, nothing at times. He endured the discrimination, knowing he had only one choice. My mindset was to be the best that I could be at everything that I did so that the world could see that I was at least up to par with its standards. He worked for the railroad, but ended up working for the city of Birmingham at the jail. Promoted there too over the years to lieutenant and eventually assistant jail administrator, serving his city and his community. I tried to let my work speak for me. I had a feeling that I'm sure most people of my ilk had, and that is that this must end. Soon. Foster said it was his faith that carried him his whole life, a faith he still embraces. Always be faithful, and it will pay off. A soldier who never surrendered. A man who still stands tall by serving today. Incredible. Foster Woodrick will turn 89 his next birthday. He says he will continue to work in his church wherever he is needed as long as he can. To say that the Vietnam War was unpopular is an understatement. The U.S. involvement in Vietnam sparked rage and protests in this country. And when Vietnam veterans returned home, they did not always get the hero's welcome as veterans of previous wars. What Lauren McAnally tells me is, even with all that in mind, the brotherhood he found would last a lifetime. Our gunships would go in with us, and I mean, these guys were on our wings. Our guys were firing rockets and grenades and, and machine guns. Lauren McAnally was a teenager facing the enemy, flying Huey helicopters, delivering ammo and water. I was 18 when I said I do, and I was just turned 19 when I graduated from flight school and I was 19 when I went on my first tour in Vietnam. His new reality left him petrified most of the time. Now we expect 25% casualties and you're going like, what? You know, well we expect, you know, a quarter of you to be shot down. Some days you would make 20 landings. 
those Hueys uh, were unarmed. We did not fly with any guns on them whatsoever. There was no door guns. Facing the enemy, living in constant peril, truly made them a band of brothers. You're really more fighting for the guy next to you to take care of the people you know, and you would do anything to uh, make sure they were safe. And uh, it, that's, most of the time, things were happening so fast you didn't think about it. McAnally got shot down more than once. And as we went over and fired our rockets, and then you turn, and you turn your belly up to them to get out, bing, 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 <laughs> you could hear rounds hitting the aircraft. All the lights come on, the uh, aircraft, the warning lights that you have. And I said words we can't say on TV to him, but we ended up having to go down. Fast thinking and a repair saved lives. It was one round that did all the damage and it went, it was a round that went through the deck and came up through the oil reservoir and all the oil had drained out. Well our maintenance, the captain maintenance uh, uh, man came out with his team and he looked at it and he said, well that's all there is. He says, looked around, he says, give me that stick. We took a stick, he whittled a stick, took a hammer, he hammered it up through the deck into the oil reservoir filled it up with oil and said, ah, we're good to go. So you guys go ahead and fly it out. But exposure to a chemical called Agent Orange left many of his crew battling a different kind of enemy for a lifetime, cancer. Agent Orange, how, you got exposed to that? Yes. How, was that some of the bombs that were? No, we sprayed it. You sprayed it. Uh, you, yeah, that's right. We, we, we were in the helicopters, uh, we were in a place, the Ashaw Valley, they call it. We had to go in and spray rice paddies and up in the valleys uh, to try and, and stop because the BC and the North Vietnamese would use the food supply. His worst memory, losing one of his crew. But there were good memories that bonded his crew for life. Best memories, Christmas at Chu Lai. We were stationed at Chu Lai and we were in sort of semi buildings. There were tents over wooden frames and you had a floor and stuff. And they actually had a place where you had a, uh, an exchange and you had an officer's club and stuff like that. It was decent. You didn't have to worry about getting hit where you were at. It was saddened that we were all missing. This was our first Christmas, most of us away from anybody, all of our families. We had a real just tight group of guys that we, we got, people got presents, people got food, people got in, and we just shared, everybody shared. Whenever a package came in, you shared. But You were a family, really. And we still are to this day. And they stay in touch. And Lauren McAnally now serves at the American Village, giving tours and talking to young people about his service and the importance of remembering all who served their country. Now to our special series, Voices of War. As we honor our veterans tonight, the special woman with a determined spirit, a heart of gold, and a lifesaver amid war. Birmingham resident Ginger Branson saw it all during Desert Storm. Christopher Sign introduces us to this local war hero with a story unlike any other. What we had was the uh, patients that were the result of the battles. The pictures bring back a flood of memories. That was our hospital. We had a wow. lot of people. Some good, others stressful, but all reveal a moment in time that changed the world and history. You saw it all. Saw it all. This is Ginger Branson. Ginger is a war hero, not only surviving Desert Storm, but making sure others survived as well. I asked her about the moment she and her fellow nurses were told to get ready. It was three o'clock in the morning on January 17th, 1991, and um, we were living on a Saudi military post, but we prayed, and the prayer ended with, God bless America, <laughs> amen. <laughs> she and her sisters only knew to expect the unexpected. And it was very emotional. We were all tears running down our cheeks. The Alabama native treated the wounded in Desert Storm. The RN helped save lives when her own life was in danger. When the ground fire started, um, scuds were coming over and the Patriot missiles, though, who are our heroes, were taking them out right and left. The Patriot uh, missiles took out every single scud but one for five months. 
because when the war ended, the scuds didn't. At times, Ginger and others treated patients while wearing heavy, bulky chemical gear. But we had not just the American soldiers, not just our military. We also had a huge part of the multinational forces. We weren't there alone. We had French soldiers and Egyptian soldiers and German soldiers. Like a melting pot of culture in a battlefield hospital, multinational nursing forces faced with a language barrier, all with the same goal. My hospital saw over 30,000 patients, whether they were outpatients, inpatients, we did over 400 major surgical procedures. Some were quite memorable. Have any idea what this x-ray reveals? We had um, Saudi soldiers, one that had sat on a hand grenade and to save his buddies. That x-ray, that's shrapnel. And they saved the Saudi soldier with most of his insides rearranged amid one nonstop sound. But that night, it was I couldn't even tell you how many. It was just almost constant explosions overhead. Through the explosions and trauma patients, Ginger says there were moments of hope and compassion. We communicated with sign language. You know, he would say, do you have children? And I'd say, yeah, I do. She's talking about a Saudi prince she treated. He had a heart attack. And every day for weeks, they communicated. When he left, he shook my hand. You know, you're not supposed to touch women, but we had to touch our patients. Sure. So I had touched him several times, but he shook my hand and he gave me his prayer beads. And he said, thank you. <laughs> Man, I've still got those prayer beads. Oh, wow. Ginger was there for five months and experienced the ugly side of war and the caring side of humanity. And her mission is not over. She still helps people heal, dedicated to helping veterans in need. When you give them a coat in the winter, or when you give them a job, or a, you know something to eat, you saved a life right there. Ginger Branson doesn't like the term hero, and this veteran is a hero. We all save lives in one way or another. What a story. Ginger Branson, in fact, has published a new book about her work as a nurse during the war. And she now dedicates her time helping other veterans, most often lending an ear and reminding others to appreciate all of our veterans. We've seen the images, soldiers running into the waiting arms of family members, kisses from loved ones, hugs from children. And for many soldiers, though, it is what happens next that truly changes them. Sarah Snyder introduces us to an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran, four tour tours of duty, two Purple Hearts, and one story turned melody. This story is too hard to tell, too painful to go back. When I lived home, there was a lot of things I didn't know. You have got to let it go, because I, I lived that world to hold it in. I lost everything. So United States Marine veteran Matt Bine put it to music, now performed by local, even nationally renowned artists. Every word a reminder. It's kind of like an avenue to vent. Every melody a trip back to the place that left him scarred. You kind of just grow into it as a rhythm. But in each rhythm, there's healing. Change my story into a therapeutic song that would help me, you know, A, take a deep breath, or B, just cry it out because I needed to cry. His life now, a much different tune. A dad, business owner, and songwriter, Bine says his journey is like many others, soldiers trying to reintegrate. We're the greatest fighting force in the entire world. And I mean, you know, soon enough, the Space Force, maybe even the galaxy, but, you know, so we're trained for everything except for how to come home. Coming home, for many, the most difficult part of combat. The training is meant to break you down mentally to be able to prepare you for the toughness ahead. Bine conquered four tours of duty, the first in Iraq in 2005. He was injured, came home, received a Purple Heart, and realized he wanted to go back. His final mission, Afghanistan in 2009, as a Joint Terminal TAC Controller. We control all of the indirect fire on the battlefield, so the airplanes, the naval ships, you know, missiles, I mean, even the intelligence aircraft. 
I mean, it's, you know, the JTAC is, I mean, you got the most, you got the firepower of the United States military at your command. We're the southernmost tip of uh, Afghanistan and Helmand, which was, you know, no area to play nicely in. While on a three-day patrol, they saw what looked like a family picking corn. He didn't think much of it until a blast. It was just, you know, a chaotic incident. And I came to, and I was looking up at corn stalks. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I started thinking, oh boy, you know, not again. And when I tried to push myself up, like it was just blood coming out of my face. And I mean, my, my nose, my ears, uh, my eyes were, you know, they were tearing so much that they were bleeding. He was medevaced out. One of the doctors always kept telling me, he was like, you know, what, what do you really have to prove anymore? You've done it all. And that's where it's hard to come back and really understand how societies work. It's really hard. Um, it took me literally losing everything I had. Guilty that I'm alive. For Bine, healing came in the strum of his guitar, telling his story so that over time, he can let go. You have to let go of it to... to get better. You have to let go of that memory to become the person that you were meant to be. Sarah Snyder, ABC 3340 News. So far, Sarah tells us that he has written seven songs, mostly country, a little rock and roll. Some are published and even being considered by record labels right now. He says his mission now, though, is helping fellow veterans reintegrate through job fairs and more support groups.